Bankruptcies are on the rise. Will they keep going up? That's coming up today on Business Matters. Good afternoon and thank you very much for being here with me. I'm your host, Don Ma, starting off with markets. Uh, as always, today S&P 500 fell off its record high, uh, down about 9 tenths of a percent today. Uh, tech selling off a little with the Nasdaq down 2% as well. But the Dow holding steady here, up 1 tenth of a percent. Uh, investors are likely digesting lots of interesting economic news today. We have details on new inflation data and earnings coming up, up later today. Now, some individual big movers today uh, were Tesla down 8% on reports that its robo-taxi rollout is delayed. And possibly on the exact same news, taxi company Uber is up 6%. And consumers cutting back here. That's the picture being painted today by earnings reports and forecasts. Conagra Brands is projecting lower sales and snack giant PepsiCo missed second quarter revenue expectations. Now, price cuts in refrigerated and frozen food helped raise volumes for Conagra, uh, but its snack category remained strained. ConAgra expects its fiscal year 2025 organic sales to be flat to down 1.5%. PepsiCo is seeing similar struggles here. Its two largest divisions, its North America beverage unit and Frito-Lay North America both saw volumes drop. PepsiCo along with Delta Airlines are both consumer bellwethers and both have reported disappointing numbers. Stocks for Conagra and Delta are both down. PepsiCo shares seem to hold. Now, the big consumer price index report. One of the country's main inflation measures unexpectedly fell last month. So for the first time in four years, government data shows prices went down month over month. The CPI falling 0.1% in June compared to May. It was mainly helped by falling energy prices. Data showing relief of 2%. Gas prices down almost 4% and fuel down 2.5%. Used car truck prices down 1.5%. And separate data showing unsold inventory is climbing in the housing market, suggesting people aren't buying like they were. But in other areas, prices are still climbing. Food at home prices up 0.1%. Food away from home up 0.4%. So the CPI is now at 3% for the last 12 months. Now, if you remember, just two years ago, it was over 9%. So a lot of progress here. And for a deeper discussion on today's inflation report, I spoke to the president of the National Taxpayers Union, Peter Sepp. I asked him if there is a way to beat inflation without beating the consumer at the same time. All right, Pete, thank you so much for your time this afternoon. Uh, CPI inflation report out today seems to be good news, right? Uh, uh, down for the month, uh, slowed as well on a year over year basis. Uh, tell us, is the consumer in, uh, in a better shape now? Consumers may be seeing a light at the end of the tunnel, but the tunnel is still pretty long here and there could be a lot of obstacles on the way. We have, for example, lower gasoline prices, but those could be headed up thanks to problems in hurricane season, the fact that the heat wave is interrupting refinery supplies, the fact that you still have bad government policies driving up housing costs. Those could all contribute to inflation. There's plenty going on in the economy that gives us pause here to say, let's keep the champagne on ice. Well, let's talk about a little bit on consumer spending here. Uh, would you say that slowing down a bit? Uh, we, we've seen some indicators of consumer spending slowing down. Do you think that has contributed to inflation coming down? Oh, yes, definitely. And the important thing here is to figure out what the cause is. Are folks pulling back because their budgets are simply getting tighter? Are they pulling back because the sugar high of all that government stimulus during the COVID era has finally worn off? Those are important questions that we have to answer because if we don't know, 
going forward, we could make some very serious policy errors. The federal government, for example, could simply write more checks or create more subsidies for housing that could make the problem worse instead of focusing on the core issues, which is just leaving that money in the pockets of people who earned it in the first place. Would the Federal Reserve cutting interest rates uh, provide relief to the economy? Quite possibly. It's important to remember, though, there are already concerns among some in Washington that if the Fed moves too quickly, such as lowering interest rates in September, that could be taken as a sign that there's election influence going on. And we certainly don't want to see that. I'm sure Chairman Powell at the Fed doesn't want to create that appearance either. How, how strong is, is this concern in Powell's mind in that uh, if he does in fact cut rates uh, in September that he's worried that uh, it may appear he's supporting a candidate over another? I imagine that Chairman Powell does have that concern. After all, the Federal Reserve tries to pride itself on being above the political fray. This could very well seem either way to be entering that fray. So then your belief is because of this, uh, rate cuts will be delayed? It's quite possible that they will be delayed. All right, so if, if, uh, if we do get a rate cut then, you would say it would be after the election, maybe in November and December, would that be a good guess? I think it's likelier that it would be after the election. I may be proven wrong, but I think the political pressure here is pretty strong. All right, so what do we need to do in order for inflation to go down, but not at the same time squeezing consumers? Yeah, the Fed can play a role here, a very big one, but it can't only be the role player here. Policymakers need to pull levers as well. Governments need to respond to the pressures that they have created on inflation. In housing, that means at the local level, get rid of permitting laws that prevent housing from being built in the first place. Cut back on property taxes, which are by far the biggest contributor to housing and closing costs. With taxes, you've got to be able to help people afford their daily living expenses by letting them keep more of their own money. It's pretty simple, but it seems to elude governments at all levels. All right, thank you so much for your time today, Pete. My pleasure. And the White House is handing out $1.7 billion to juice electric vehicles in America. Now, the funding, which comes from the Landmark Inflation Reduction Act, will help convert closed down or at-risk auto manufacturing and assembly plants to make electric and hybrid vehicles. And the awardees include major automakers like GM, for example, and Volvo, as well as suppliers like American Auto Parts. The Biden administration says these projects will create 2,900 new jobs and save 15,000 jobs that may have been eliminated. The growth rate in new electric vehicle sales has slowed as automakers struggle to bridge the gap from early adopters to mass market consumers. Meanwhile, the Internal Revenue Service is cracking down on wealthy tax cheats. So last fall, the IRS launched an initiative to collect from millionaires who have not paid the taxes they owe. The agency identified about 1,600 taxpayers with more than $1 million in income who owes more than $250,000 in tax. To date, more than $1 billion has been recovered from those individuals. The effort is still ongoing. The IRS ramped up its enforcement efforts with the money it received from the Inflation Reduction Act Congress passed nearly two years ago. Also, bankruptcies, it looks like across the board, soared 14% during the first quarter. Before Q2 numbers come in, we speak with the president of the American Bankruptcy Institute, Chris Ward, to see where things may be headed. Bankruptcy filings are expected to continue rising after a 14% surge in the first quarter. We've seen this incredible increase, and you know, I think it will it'll continue into the second half of 2024. 
But I don't think at the end of the day it's ever going to reach the, the pre-pandemic levels. Chris Ward is the president of the American Bankruptcy Institute, America's largest association of bankruptcy professionals. He says bankruptcy filings won't reach pre-pandemic levels, but we will see more of them. That's due to economic factors like inflation, elevated borrowings, lower consumer savings, and a pullback in spending. Everyone has come to the realization that the higher interest rates are going to last for the foreseeable future, and that's affecting businesses. Um, it's also led to inflation increases in the U.S., um, which is going to reduce the consumer discretionary spending. Ward says many COVID programs have reached the end of their lifespan, leaving fewer lifelines for people who are desperate. A key concern, it just became harder for small businesses to go through bankruptcy. The subchapter 5 bankruptcy law lets businesses use special bankruptcy rules. We've unfortunately recently seen a sunset of the debt cap on subchapter 5 with respect to businesses. Um, it was raised to seven and a half million dollars during the pandemic um, on June 21st of this year. Um, that sunset and the debt cap went back to approximately three million. A lower debt cap means fewer businesses will qualify for special subchapter five treatment. Ward and the American Bankruptcy Institute are working with Congress to raise the cap and help small businesses. And the biggest bank in the U.S. has ambitious goals to grow even bigger. So J.P. Morgan Chase has set a lofty goal of attracting 15% of the country's consumer deposits. That's what CEO of Consumer and Community Banking, Marianne Lake, told Reuters. The latest available data shows that the bank had about 11.3% of U.S. retail deposits at the end of June last year. Lake also said that the lender wants to provide credit cards that account for 20% of the nation's spending. Right now, it's at about 17%. Lake said that the bank isn't laying out a timeline per se for the goal, but is geared toward achieving it. Lake is one of the candidates actually under consideration to replace current CEO Jamie Dimon. And on that note, a good time to take a break. Coming up soon, your Costco membership is going to cost more. And Germany moving to ban China's Huawei and ZTE from its 5G telecom networks. That and more after the break. Don't. You know, sometimes you just have to spend money to save money. At least. That's what Costco hopes uh, its members think. The retailer is raising membership fees. It's only going to cost basic members an extra five bucks a year though. uh, And that's going to bring the cost up to $65. Executive memberships are going up 10 bucks to $130. It's the first uh, membership price hike in seven years. Uh, But it should keep help uh, other prices down at the store. Last year, Costco made uh, $4.6 billion from membership fees alone. So the new membership fees are going to go into effect September 1st. Now, it's going to cost more to get behind the wheel of a Tesla Model 3 in Europe. The carmaker said this is due to increased tariffs on China-made electric vehicles. And Tesla has raised the price by about $1,600 in countries like Germany, the Netherlands, and Spain, for example. Tesla makes the Model 3 in Shanghai and is the top exporter of EVs from China. European Commission, uh, it upped tariffs by about 38% at the start of this month. Uh, This was for what it describes as a potential flood of unfairly subsidized Chinese-made EVs. China, of course, rejects this characterization. Uh, The tariffs are provisional at this point. The commission will decide by November whether to make them permanent. And Germany reaching an agreement with its telecommunications companies to ban Chinese equipment from their 5G infrastructure starting in 2029. Berlin sees Chinese involvement as a potential security risk. Here's Germany's interior minister today. We must reduce security risks and, unlike in the past, avoid one-sided dependencies. We must become more independent and crisis-proof. Critical components from major Chinese telecommunications companies Huawei and ZTE will need to be removed from Germany's 5G core networks by the end of 2026, while non-core network equipment 
must be replaced by the end of 2029. Listen. We can thus protect the central nervous system of Germany as a business location. And above all, we can also protect the communications of citizens, of companies and the state. The move marks a turning point in a years-long saga. Back in March of 2019, Germany's chancellor said she did not want to give into pressure from other countries to stop business with Huawei, saying they weren't going to exclude a company simply because they were Chinese. But the U.S. added restrictions on business dealings with Huawei in mid-2019, and many European countries followed suit. Uh, a couple of years ago, the European Commission urged Germany to implement their 5G security guidelines and dial back their use of Huawei equipment. Germany has uh, actually was the largest European country to propose any restrictions or bans on equipment from China's Huawei in September of last year. Meanwhile, Audi has signed a deal with Lionel Messi's soccer club. Inter Miami CF to become the team's official automotive partner. Audi's uh, chief marketing officer says uh, the deal could help reach it. Uh, a, a growing soccer fan base here in the States. Uh, in celebrating the deal, Audi showed off a fleet wrapped in, in Inter Miami's signature pink color. They will be on permanent display at Chase Stadium for the remainder of the season. The deal comes at a big moment for soccer in America. The Copa America 2024 final happens this Sunday in Miami. And staying in sports, the NBA is used to scoring big on the court. Now it could score an 11-year, $76 billion media rights deal. So here's what we know. The league is in talks with ESPN, ABC, and NBC, and Amazon Prime Video. Its board of governors could approve the deal next week. Then the finished contracts will go to TNT Sports, who will have five days to match one of the deals or lose the NBA. Tip-off for the new media deal would be for the 2025-2026 season. Now we have Dave Martin, major uh, sports correspondent at a uh, at NTD here. So Dave, um, the, the deal is pretty significant here uh, as AP has reporting on, on the news. Uh, as I said earlier, the NBA is nearing a, a major agreement here with three different broadcast partners. Now my question for you is, if approved, what would be the ramifications? Well, you know, for one thing, NBC is back as their main or one of their main TV partners. Now. They had the, the NBA rights from 1990 through 2002. Those are the Michael Jordan like dynasty years. Now Jordan, he was a huge draw. In fact, those finals in 97, 98 between his Bulls and the Jazz, still those are the highest rated in the NBA finals history. And everybody loved NBC's theme music, Round Ball Rock. That'll be coming back as well. Now back to this uh, proposed package. ABC, ESPN, as you mentioned, they're still part of it. They would have the top package, so they still would retain the NBA Finals. Also, you mentioned Amazon Prime. They've been, they will have now Thursday night, Friday night, and Saturday night games. Now, that starts after the NFL season, which they're also involved with. Meanwhile, you've got TNT Sports. They would actually be out. Now, they've been carrying games since 1984. What that means is they're very popular show inside the NBA with like Ernie Johnson, Charles Barkley, Kenny Smith, Shaq. That would be out. That's maybe their, the biggest thing that they bring. But as you mentioned, TNT Sports has five days to match this agreement. That clock doesn't start until you know, it's finalized, of course. So. All right. Uh, I have one more question for you on this. So the numbers being thrown around here are staggering. 11 years, total of $76 billion. So if true, what does this mean for player salaries? I mean, they would go through the roof, and they're already high. The average NBA player makes $10 million a season. But that 11-year, $76 billion figure you mentioned, that comes to just under $7 billion a season. That's near the NFL's $10 billion a season. And it's more than double their last year. Their last year was like nine, nine years, $24 billion. In any case, should this new deal result in the league's salary cap going up 10% per season, which is the maximum it can under their collective bargaining agreement, you could possibly have your, the league's first ever $100 million season contract player by, before this deal is out, which is going to be 2036. Now, right now, the highest average annual salary, Jason Tatum at $62 million. So 
business is definitely good for the NBA right now. Well, all right, Dave, thank you so much for your time today. Always, uh, always good to hear your insight. Thanks for having me, Don. Thank you. And the Paris Olympics are on their way, and one key focus for athletes is their diet. A sports nutrition expert explains how diet plays a crucial role in pushing athlete performance to peak levels. Here's more. Olympic athletes train hard and are always looking for something that gives them an edge over competitors. Their diet plays a crucial role in determining their success. Yeah, so Olympic athletes, when it comes to nutrition, these are the elite of the elite athletes. And so nutrition really can set them apart when you talk about getting a second different or an inch different. Nutrition can be that separator. A wide variety of factors must be taken into account in a top-notch nutrition plan for each athlete and they need to make sure that they're meeting calorie requirements, macronutrient requirements, that they're recovering and taking full advantage of what nutrition can offer them. Hydration plays a crucial role in peak athletic performance. There's no one-size-fits-all approach. Sports nutritionists create individual hydration plans for each Olympian based on their own personal needs. Of course, everyone needs to stay hydrated in general, a baseline level of hydration. But when it comes to how much does an athlete need, it's going to depend on their body size, their temperature and humidity that they're training in, uh, their clothes that they're wearing in the environment. I mean, there's so many factors and just their propensity to sweat. Are they a heavy sweater? Are they not a heavy sweater? So in terms of staying hydrated for an Olympic level athlete, it's going to be really personalized and not just how much fluid they need, but also how much sodium do they need. The intensity and duration of Olympic athletes' workouts require specific calorie intake needs. So calorie needs for an Olympic level athlete are going to depend on a number of different things as well. Body size is going to factor in. A bigger body is going to need more calories than a smaller body. The sport is hugely impactful in how much training they're doing. But I would tell you from just a general guesstimate, on the low end, we're talking probably at least 3,000 or more calories. That would be really a pretty low recommendation. All the way up to six, seven, eight thousand 8,000 calories and maybe even more. The U.S. Olympic team has their own sports dietitian for the upcoming games, which begin on July 26th. And with that, all the stories we have for you today. Thank you very much for watching. Uh, and if you have any feedback, please feel free to let me know. You can email us at business at ntd.com or you can simply leave a comment online. I do read them. And as I always say, business matters. See you tomorrow.